Jesus, once again, we come into your presence and we ask for a blessing, not because we feel in any way worthy to receive such a blessing, but because you are worthy to receive a blessing, and you have given us permission, you've actually encouraged us to come to you with boldness. So we're doing that now, and we ask you to bless our understanding as we open your word together tonight, and help us to know you better, help us to know more about you when we're done, in your name we pray, amen. Okay, over the past few nights, we have been learning what the Bible says about the origin of this world, and the past few nights, I really mean over the past week, did you know that we're 25% of the way done with the story of hope? Yeah, I know, right? On the very first night when we got together, I, I said this is a four-week seminar, uh, but don't be too intimidated by that, it'll be over before you know it, and here we are a quarter of the way through. Bet you doesn't feel that way. But we had meeting number six on Wednesday, and there's only 24, so that's a quarter of the way. Tonight is chapter seven. Up to this point, we've been learning what the Bible says about the origin of our world. And we found that God has been embroiled in an eternal conflict, and he's been fending off these accusations from the devil. And he's now allowed sin to grow more or less unchecked until mankind's wickedness evoked God's wrath and the world was destroyed with the flood. That was the first like nine chapters of Genesis and we talked about that in detail through Sunday night. At that point, it was now sufficiently demonstrated to the watching universe at large that sin, without God's righteous influence as a check, would destroy even the most noble creatures very quickly. Following now the flood, God took a different approach. We saw that the lifespans of mankind shrank dramatically by many, many centuries. And that kind of automatically puts a check on mankind's ability to mature in sin, you know? Uh, but we saw, as the world began to be repopulated, that wickedness again began to take root, despite the shortened lifespan of man. And so God raised up a representative, a man of faith named Abraham, through whom all of the world would be blessed. We looked at that on Wednesday. So, no, God was really no longer willing to let sin run amok, unchecked in the new world after the flood. And so Abraham then became the beginning of God's representative kingdom on this fallen earth. Abraham's amazing life of faith Give, gave rise to the lineage of people who would bear the promised Messiah. We call them the Israelites and then the Jews. Right? And then Abraham, of course, was himself the point of origin for Judaism and Christianity and Islam. So tonight we're going to move forward in the story about 450 years or so. And we're going to meet now the descendants of Abraham as we begin Act 2 of the story of hope. All of the messages in Act 2 are super titled, as you see up there, The New Beginning. So up to this point it has been in the beginning, but we're not in the beginning anymore. Now we're at the new beginning, so that is what Act 2 is going to be called. The story is going to focus now on how God reintroduced himself to the world um, during the generations after Abraham. Tonight's chapter is called The Great Escape, as you see up there on the screen. And it is not called that because the lead character is Steve McQueen. <laughs> Two laughs. Man, I love fun pop culture in church. <laughs> um, so Abraham is the genealogical starting point for the nation of Israel. The ethnic Jews among us today in the 21st century look backwards on their ancestry and trace it back to Abraham. They are blood descendants of Abraham. Um, here's how the Bible says that this happened, the relationship between the one man and the nation. Abraham's grandson was named Jacob. And later on in his life, Jacob was renamed by God as Israel. Jacob had 12 sons and their, their families as well. The sons and their families comprised the original tribes of Israel, right? 
And so the nations that formed because of these families were collectively known as Israel. Throughout history, this same people group has also been known as Hebrews, likely because of their ancestor Eber, who we see listed in Genesis chapters 10 and 11. So that's kind of, kind of a neat thing. That's probably where that word comes from. We're going to see that title in the scriptures tonight, Hebrews. Abraham, we're, the first scripture that we're going to look at tonight was a vision that Abraham received. He received a vision from God concerning his descendants, the Israelites. He got this vision before he even had a son, let alone 12 great-grandsons. So this is a prophecy, future telling. We find this prophecy in Genesis chapter 15. It reads as such, Genesis 15, verses 13 and 14. Then he, that's God, said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. This prophecy was fulfilled in Egypt. Uh, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. That's why they were in bondage, right? As uh, they were, what does the prophecy say? They will afflict them. So they were in affliction there in Egypt. Once the period of probation for Egypt ended, and in this prophecy it's delineated as 400 years, so once that was over, then God would judge and punish Egypt for what they had done and bless Israel with abundance. That's essentially the meat and potatoes of this prophecy and what it's saying. Abraham did not actually live to see this promise fulfilled. But we are going to see it fulfilled tonight as we learn about the great escape and the experience of the Israelite people afterwards. Now, some of you may know this story already, but I'll try to make it interesting for you, even if you are already familiar with the Great Escape, otherwise known as the Exodus. The first generation of Israel moved to Egypt in peace. They were actually welcomed there. But shortly afterward, a different king came to power, and Israel fell out of favor with the new government. They were then enslaved and forced into bitter bondage in service to Pharaoh. By the end of the 400 years, and if you do the math on this, it was not 400 solid years of slavery. It was just 400 years in Egypt. So when the entire period ended, um, God had had enough. No more. Probation was over. God raised up at that time a man named Moses to act as his representative in demanding the Israelites' freedom from Egypt. Each time the Egyptian leader Pharaoh refused to let the people go, God, through Moses, hit Egypt with a plague. These were not random plagues. Here's how we understand this. Egypt was a polytheistic society. Everybody know what that means? Many gods. They worshipped everything. Like all pagan nations, they worshipped the sun. They did. That is, by the way, a legacy of Nimrod, who we met on Wednesday. So that came from him. Uh, but also, I mean, everything had a god. Every single thing. The god of the river, the god of the wind, the cattle were gods, dung beetles were gods, you know? And so each of the plagues that Israel's god sent into Egypt was a rebuke against one of Egypt's false gods. They worshipped the river, so God turned the river to blood. They worshipped the frog, so God flooded them with frogs. Right? And then they died and stank up the land. They worshipped the sun, so God cloaked them in darkness. And as is always the case, every time, mankind's impenitence, and that means refusal to repent, refusal to be humble, refusal to come back to God and admit their mistakes, Mankind's impenitence reached a limit that God would not permit it to pass. And he sent one final plague to force Pharaoh to his knees, if you will. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, the Bible says, or records God as saying, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So you see, God's ultimate claim over us is that he made us. He's the creator, right? 
We are his. He bought us. He made us. He bought us back. We're his twice over. So as our creator, he has the privilege of doing with us whatever he wishes. And that's kind of an uncomfortable thought for some, but it's true. You know, we can argue with God all we want, but we are ultimately powerless over him, right? We can't actually do anything. So in Egypt, God exercised this authority by reclaiming a portion of his creation, the firstborn of every household. Now, God has always had the right to do this. He's God. He's the creator, right? He just simply never executed that right until this night. This is a terrible price to pay, isn't it? You lose your firstborn? So God gave him a way out. As God always does. Just as he did with the ark to escape the great flood, and just as he always does. We're going to see several examples of this. God's judgment, you can't escape it except in the manner that he provides, because he always does provide a way. So Exodus chapter 12, verse 3. God is telling Moses now to speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. So it's saying you have to now choose a lamb to die in place of the firstborn. And you do this on the tenth day of the month. See, something's going to die that night. Death is coming to Egypt that night. And they had a choice. It can be my firstborn, or it can be this lamb instead of my firstborn. Right? And the choice was theirs. The choice is always ours to make. Verse 6. Now you shall, God says, now you shall keep it, meaning the lamb you've chosen, until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. This same lamb was now killed as a sacrifice on the 14th day of the month. Dying now. Not just chosen in place of the firstborn, but actually dying now in place of the firstborn. Verse 7 continues. God says, And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. So they, now, they are supposed to now cover the entrance to their household with the blood of the sacrificed lamb. And notice how specific he is. You have to put it exactly in this place. God is a specific God, amen? Verse 13 continues again. God says, Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And so very straightforwardly, God says, When he sees the blood of the Lamb... He passes over the household, and the firstborn inside is there. So, picture this here. God's justice and God's mercy meet at the blood of the Lamb. That's how it goes. And so this takes place, and God reclaims the firstborn of every household in Egypt, except those covered by the blood of the Lamb. And it's worth noting that any household could have participated in this. It was an exercise in faith. So Israelite households were not spared this if they neglected the blood. Similarly, Egyptian households were not afflicted by this if they had the blood, right? God was not executing an exercise in ethnicity here. Do you get it? But rather an exercise of faith. And this is always true for God. I says, I'm dwelling on this because this is a point that many people, I think, don't understand. Like if you're ethnically Jewish, you're somehow better in the sight of God. Or if you have claimed to be a Christian, you're somehow better in the sight of God. And that's just not right. As summarized by the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, Peter, we commonly know him as Saint Peter, right? He's like the ultimate human person in the Catholic tradition. And yet he says, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. 
I mean, if you can't trust what comes out of Peter's mouth, what can you trust, right? I guess Jesus. <laughs> Jesus trumps Peter. But Peter comes pretty close in, in the terms of uh, the chain of authority. And he says, God does not show partiality just because you have a certain kind of blood in you. So now this plague on the firstborn just destroys what is left of Egypt. And Pharaoh, now without his oldest son, heartbreakingly, lets the Israelites go. Now, do we remember the criteria for the Passover lamb? It was chosen on the tenth day, sacrificed on the fourteenth day, sacrificed in a way that shed its blood, and that, we, that the Israelite people received salvation from the plague by covering their homes with this blood. Well, now, we're going to see something interesting here. The Bible says, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, the way that Jesus tells us about himself is through prophecy. So it should not surprise us, then, to see Jesus all over this Passover event. The Gospel tells us when he was chosen to die. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verse 18, said, and the, excuse me, and the scribes and chief priests heard it, heard, what, heard about Jesus, and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching. Now, when we read the context here, and you kind of have to piece together, the best way I've found is you start in John with the triumphal entry and you, kind of, you have to kind of compare John and Mark to get the timeline exactly. But when you do that, you will see that this took place on the second day of the week of Christ's last week before the crucifixion. In other words, Monday. Sunday's day one, Monday's day two. The day after he entered Jerusalem in a parade, which we commonly call Palm Sunday. Friday was Passover. <coughs> Passover is the 14th of the month. You do your subtraction, that makes Monday the 10th of the month. You see that? So Jesus was chosen on the 10th day of the month, which is when, of course, all of the Passover lambs were chosen. It's well known that he died on the day of Passover, the 14th, which was when the Passover lambs were slaughtered. And of course, he shed much blood at his death. Goodness gracious. And this sacrifice which was given to take the place of the one who truly deserves to die, that's me, and that's you. That sacrifice offers salvation to those who are covered in the blood of the Lamb. Hmm. Today is the 14th. Amen. We go by a little different calendar, but that, that's a cool coincidence that I didn't even put together. Praise the Lord. We read in John chapter 3, verse 16, that's probably the most famous verse in the whole Bible. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is, this is why Jesus came. The fact that Jesus fulfilled the Passover in every single way is not exactly news. <laughs> I'm not giving you anything brand new tonight. We actually see in the Bible, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. There it is, right in the Bible. He is the Passover. So therefore, make no mistake, friends. It was Jesus, the Son of God, before he became a man, who executed judgment on Egypt that night. And it was Jesus the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, who showed mercy to the faithful. How heartbreaking, and I'm, I'm actually saying this now from like the deepest part of my heart, because I unfortunately have people in my life that fall into this category, but how heartbreaking that so many of our Jewish friends and relatives faithfully Remember the Passover every year. And by doing so, they fail to realize that they are <coughs> celebrating a prophecy of Jesus Christ. I have family. Family. Blood family. And they do this. And they just don't even realize. Anyway, so Egypt was judged. 
God is long-suffering and merciful to us, is he not? It sometimes seems that he has forsaken his people. You ever felt forsaken from time to time? But in fact, what he's doing most of the time is allowing more time for others to repent. Possibly allowing more time for you to repent. <laughs> this is what God does. But there always comes a point when God's limit is reached and his ministry of mercy is replaced by his ministry of justice. That always comes. And this is something to remember in today's world, I think, when the word Christian is an increasingly popular punchline, when God's laws and commands are largely disregarded on purpose, the faithful are viewed with increasing skepticism and scorn. By the way, look around this room. How many people do you see here tonight? We invited close to 30,000 people, but most of them have something better to do. Do you see? The very attendance in this room is testifying to what I'm saying. It is getting harder and harder to follow the pure religion of Jesus Christ in today's world. But the world would do well to remember the Bible's warning in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. My prayer is that after this seminar is over, that you will decide to be on the right side of God. Amen. Two amens. But good enough. And that's better than zero. Yes. <laughs> I believe the time is drawing short before we're going to see another series of events just like the Exodus here on the earth. Now, why do I think that? Where did that idea come from? It turns out that Revelation tells us that something very similar will happen on the earth immediately prior to Christ's return. I do, I do mean like immediately prior. There are seven final plagues recorded in the book of Revelation, the end result of which is the total destruction of the earth. We read all about them in Revelation chapter 16. We're going to discuss them more in future meetings, but here's a nice overview for you. I hope you can read that. I just went right down the, the chapter to outline it for you. The first plague is painful boils. That's verse 2 of Revelation 16. The second plague is when the seas become blood and all the creatures inside the seas die. That's verse 3. The third plague is when the fresh water also becomes blood and then the creatures inside of that water die. That's verse 4. <clears throat> the fourth plague is extreme unrelenting heat. That's verses 8 and 9. The fifth plague is a plague of darkness on the seat of Babylon. Babylon is the like headquarters of the evil at the end of time. That's verses 10 and 11. The sixth plague is the drying up of the Euphrates. We're going to talk about what that specifically means in a future meeting. But that's verses 12, 13, and 14. Then we see Jesus come back in verse 15. We see the battle of Armageddon in verse 16. And then the seventh and final plague is the destruction of the earth by earthquake and hail. That's verses 17 through 21. Right in the middle of there, verses 5 through 7, you'll see there's kind of a scripture gap in between the third and fourth plague there. Verses 5, 6, and 7 is the declaration of judgment from God. Now, I want to note some similarities here between Exodus and Revelation we see that they both contain a plague of blood, and a plague of frogs, and a plague of boils, and a plague of hail, and a plague of darkness. I know I didn't mention frogs in that list, but that's part of uh, one of those final plagues, part, part of the sixth plague. So in other words, these are parallel events. I hope that's clear. These are parallel events. And so in Revelation's plagues, we see Christ's return. In the parallel Exodus, that would correspond to the Passover event, right? Because Jesus is the Passover. Christ, our Passover, spares us from the judgment and destruction of the world. No differently than he did back in the Exodus. Now note in Revelation, following the return of Christ, here's the return of Christ right here, verse 15, and following that, is the battle of Armageddon in verse 16. 
Should we not see some sort of corresponding event in the story of the Exodus? I'm making the suggestion these are parallel events. So what would be that corresponding event? Because, wouldn't you know it, we do in fact see a corresponding event. After the Passover, when deliverance of the Israelites seemed sure, Pharaoh said, go! And they got their stuff and they went. And it seemed like the drama was over for them. But it wasn't. Pharaoh rose up one additional time to make a final attempt on God's people. He pursued them and then he cornered them against the Red Sea in a manner which provided them no escape. We read it in Exodus chapter 14, verses 19 and 20. Don't you love the Old Testament? Look at that whole mess of words. That's only two verses. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, okay, it says, And the angel of God, who went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. So the angel of God, in the pillar of cloud and fire, was going actually before them to lead them to the Red Sea. And when they got there, he changed positions and went behind them instead. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it, it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, Egypt, and it gave light by night to the other, Israel, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. So God now intervenes with a miracle. He supernaturally preserves his people from the enemy until they have time to reach safety. Verses 21 and 22 continues and says, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right and on their left. Nobody knows exactly the path through the Red Sea that they took, but I've, I've done a little bit of homework on this, and there is a, apparently a usable land bridge underneath the surface of the water, and it goes down to a depth of, you know, I don't want to like quote the wrong number here, but it's hundreds and hundreds, maybe more than a thousand feet down. Try to now wrap your mind around the scope of this miracle. Right, where God parted the waters to such a degree that they could walk on dry ground on the seabed. It's incredible. And notice he does it with a strong east wind, because even though this was clearly the power of God, he demonstrates it through the natural forces of the world. Cool, huh? That should help you to maybe see miracles in your everyday life, right? We always expect like the big flashing you know, light from the sky, but that's not how God often works. He works through the natural things of the world. So anyway, this is the famous parting of the Red Sea. We see that God provided for them, not because of their merits, not in response to their actions, not as an executive order from the church board, but rather, God reached down from heaven and simply provided what they needed to make it to the promised land. Deliverance from slavery and rebirth into relationship with God. After an unknown amount of time passes, still the same night though, we just don't know how long, whether it was minutes or hours or what, the Bible states in Exodus 14 verse 23, the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea, all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. God now released the forces of darkness. And you would think they would have had sense enough to repent after everything that they had seen. But of course they do not. They do not any more so than the wicked of Revelation 16 will. And so the final battle begins. The Exodus version of the Battle of Armageddon begins. The Egyptians pursue the Israelites into the sea, obviously believing that they, with their horses and chariots and weapons of war, will overtake the stupid slaves who are on foot. This is clearly what they're thinking. But God now intervenes again because it's his fight. Amen? It's not our fight. Verses 24 and 25, still of Exodus 14. The Bible says, Now it came to pass in the morning watch, 
that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians, and he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. <laughs> I could just see, and the Bible doesn't say this, but you know, it does say that Israelites walked through a dry land. I could just see God permitting that land to get muddy. <laughs> You know, not crushing them yet, but just a little bit muddy, make it hard to just kind of walk through and drive through. And it says, you know, he's taking the chariots apart. What a mess. But see, God does not destroy them. Not yet. Not at first. Not until they acknowledge the true God of Israel. See, that? that's the point. Verse 25, they do so. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. They realize in this verse the futility of fighting against the Almighty. They recognize the sovereignty of the Lord right here. They realize that they're on the wrong side of history. Amen. They repent. But theirs is not a repentance unto life any more than Cain's was back in Genesis chapter 4. We talked about that on Sunday at 5 p.m. They, the Egyptians, repent the consequences of their actions, not the actions themselves. And just like with Cain, such repentance has no merit unto salvation. Such repentance is ultimately selfish, right? You want to preserve self, rather than, of course, losing self, which is what Christ asks us to do. And in any case, it came too late. Probation had closed, right? God's judgment had already set against them. There was no turning back for them. And so we read in verses 36, excuse me, 26 and 27. The Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The enemies of God's people are destroyed. God is victorious. And in verse 28, the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. No one was left behind. Remembering that this is parallel to the return of Christ, don't ever let anybody tell you there will be those who are left behind after Jesus comes. Amen? Okay. <clears throat> there was nobody left behind. Israel walked through the waters into a newness of life in relationship to the Lord God, literally now washing away the evidence of their past bondage to sin. Washing it away. This statement of victory is recorded of the people of God in verse 29. But the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. That's, of course, contrasted to the previous verse that shows the Egyptians getting crushed by all that same water. So that's a statement of victory. This story, and its counterpart in Revelation 16, exists to help us understand what lies in wait for this world before Christ's return. God has pronounced judgment upon this world. Do you remember? We've been looking at the three angels' messages. These three messages that go to the whole world before Jesus comes. The first such message we find in Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. The second part of that message, verse 7, says, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. So we are living in the time of God's judgment. You see, the judgment has come. Come, it's already here. It's not coming. It's here. So like Noah when he was building the ark, like the Israelites while they were in slavery, God has already pronounced his judgment and we are simply waiting for the time when that judgment will be poured out on the earth. So, I want to take a moment to show. I chose this picture on purpose. This is a picture of the judgment of God. We're not really talking about the judgment of God in any detail tonight, but I want you to see who's the one doing the accusing. Satan, Satan is doing the accusing, right? 
We often get in our minds that somehow God is trying to accuse us and condemn us. But no, no, no. This is actually a really faithful representation of God's judgment. And who's the one doing the condemning? It's not God, right? Keep that in your minds, because we will visit the judgment question later on in the story. Okay, John chapter 3, verse 18 tells us, He who believes in Jesus is not condemned. In fact, Romans 12, verse, or not Romans 12, I'm sorry, Romans 8, verse 1 says, Now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right? No condemnation. When that strange judgment does, in fact, unfold across the earth, we will see the events of Revelation 16, those plagues we've been talking about, and we will see them unfold everywhere on the planet. The boils, the blood, the sun and heat, the darkness, the drying of the Euphrates, the evil signs and wonders, the return of Jesus Christ, the battle of Armageddon, the, the last great battle between good and evil, the plague of earthquake and hail, and then praise the Lord, we will go to heaven to be with him forever. And as he returns to earth for battle, he also returns to deliver his people to their heavenly promised land, just, in fact, as he delivered the Israelites from Egypt to their promised land of Canaan. And just as the Israelites were supernaturally protected at every turn of this great escape, so too shall we survive by the Lord's merits in our great escape, not our own merits. Amen? As promised in Psalm 91, verses 9 through 11, the Bible says, the Bible promises, because you, and this talking about us, because we have made the Lord, who is our refuge, even the Most High, our dwelling place, no evil shall befall us, nor shall any plague come near our dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over us to keep us in all of our ways. Can you say amen to that? Uh, I think this is applicable to that final situation because look, no, nor shall any plague come upon you. Amen. Right? Amen. <laughs> yeah, and we don't want to be anywhere near those plagues when they come. So praise the Lord for Psalm 91. That is a promise that we should claim. Friends, the Bible tells us plainly that this world is headed for deep disaster. I mean, you know, again, I used to have to convince people of that, but I think the, the news does a pretty good job of convincing people of that these days. But after that great disaster comes a great reward. The books of Daniel and Revelation give us a prophetic timeline. Oops, I don't want to get ahead of myself there. A prophetic timeline that includes and goes beyond our present day in 2014. We can know with certainty that we are much closer to the end of that timeline than we are to the beginning of it. And I believe that we are, in fact, much closer to it than many realize, even within the church today. It is not happy news that there's trouble ahead, is it? I don't think anybody wakes up like, yes, we're one day closer to persecution, hooray, right? But you know what? There were those in Israel who surely preferred the Egyptian life of bondage because the path out of slavery was difficult, right? So as we look forward to the difficulty ahead with kind of dread and fear, we have the Israelites acting as our blueprint. Again, parallel events, right? We're not alone in this. But it is happy news, despite the kind of intimidation. Because did the Israelites stay in Egypt? No. Nor will we. The gospel actually means good news. That's what that word means. Good news! Praise the Lord, I got good news for you tonight. We're going home. <laughs> no matter what this world throws at us, no matter what crazy demonic scheme Satan has unleashed at us, no matter how dark this world gets or how close you may feel your light is to going out, oh well, friends, Jesus Christ promises to be by your side. Yes. To preserve and sustain us through those times of trouble to seal us for salvation amid a world destined for destruction, and ultimately to raise us to life at the last day, if we have to die first. If we don't make it all the way to the end, we have that promise, we'll see it anyway. 
And though the details that we're going to learn, we're certainly by no means done talking about the end times. We haven't even really started it yet, right? You notice we're going in chronological order. We're still at like 1400 BC. <laughs> so we have a lot more to talk about. But even though some of the things that we discuss may intimidate you, we must never forget that Jesus promises to get us through it. Oops. Where's Revelation? I'm just hitting buttons all over the place here. I'm sorry. That's what I want. Revelation 3.10. Because you have kept my command to persevere, this is Jesus speaking, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Remember this. Remember this one. Commit it to memory. That's a promise from Jesus. He doesn't lie. So just as he saw the Israelites safely through their plagues and the Red Sea, so too will Jesus see us through the end time trouble and plagues and safely to the heavenly kingdom, our eternal home. So that's the great escape. But it's not actually over yet. Because after you live through something like that, it, it, it became imperative for them, as it will for us, to learn a key for remembering God's protective power. Right? In other words, as you're actually watching him destroy Egypt, it's kind of hard to miss the fact that they're all perishing and you're not. But a year later, two years later, ten years later, a generation later, Guess what? You don't have those signs and wonders anymore. So God needs to give them something to remember that he is a God of mercy and a God of protection. We would be wise not to forget the same lesson that God taught to them. In the end times, we will be tempted to rely on ourselves for protection. You tell me if that's not true. Don't we have a tendency to rely on ourselves for everything? Right? Right? We are going to have that temptation, but that's a mistake. Revelation tells us that we must receive the mark of the beast in order to be safe during that time, but that mark will cost us our salvation and eternal lives. So we don't actually want the thing that the world gives us in order to be safe. We must resist that temptation to provide for ourselves, to be safe at all costs. We must remember the lessons that God gave to the Israelites so that they and we would always remember God's promises of provision. God wants us to relax. We discussed this on Wednesday, right? Jesus says in Matthew 11, verse 28, He says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Do you think he wants us to be all like nervous and jittery and you know freaked out about the end times? Or do you think he wants us to be restful and peaceful? Okay? Rest. God wants us to relax. He wants us to remember that he is in control. We've seen this before a few times already, even though we're only a week into the story. This concept of Sabbath, right? God's divine rest. And we even saw that the Bible's health principles are designed around helping our bodies to lie Sabbath and be restful and be energetic. So it should not surprise us the next thing that we see on the Israelites' journey out of Egypt. We see in Exodus now chapter 16, they celebrate in chapter 15, and so 16 is the story moving on. And the Lord said to Moses, this is chapter 16, verses 4 and 5, the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. God led them through the Red Sea right into a desert. <laughs> Water was scarce, and food was even scarcer. And so, yeah, they did have some livestock and some provisions. Ultimately, what they needed was to settle down and grow some crops and to find some wild game, right, in order to sustain a population of that size. And that was just not available for them in the wilderness. 
So God here promised to provide bread from heaven every day. Yet another divine intervention to protect them and sustain them. Verses 13 through 15 of the same chapter, we read, um, In the morning the dew lay all around the camp, and when the layer of dew lifted there, on the surface of the wilderness, was a small round substance, as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is interesting and kind of cool. That word manna, if you look it up in the Hebrew, it, it essentially means, what is it? <laughs> yeah. They, they just they gave it, they're like, what is it? And that's what they called it. <laughs> and my, my wife, when she learned this for the first time, it was like a light bulb. She was like, oh yeah, because God is like a who-ness. So the bread of God is like a whatness. I said, yes, amen. <laughs> so anyway, the manna. Moses uh, said to them, this is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. It was provided, as the Bible says, as a fine residue left behind every morning when the dew lifted. God's instructions were to go gather it early in the day or else it would actually melt in the rising heat. They had to consume it all that very day and leave none of it into the morning because if they did, it would rot and stink and become inedible. Each day, in other words, required a new <coughs> miracle. Each day required new obedience. I think that's a pretty good formula for <laughs> the Christian life too. But on the sixth day, the command was different. They were to gather twice as much as they usually did on all the other days. And the remainder of whatever they did not use on that day would not rot. It would still be good for use on the seventh day, which of course was the Sabbath day. Exodus 16, verses 20, or just verse 22. And so it was on the sixth day that they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses, Why was the sixth day different? Verses 33 and 34. Moses said to them, This is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today, and boil what you will boil, and lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning. So they laid it up until morning, as Moses commanded, and it did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. Yeah, the sixth day was ultimately to prepare for the seventh day, which was the Sabbath day. So right after, trying to link these things now, right after God brings pe the people, his people, through the most incredible and clearly most stressful thing that the world had ever seen up to that point, God gives the people a lesson about rest. And the Sabbath. Why the double portion on the sixth day? Why the carryover into the seventh day? Verses 25 and 26. Then Moses said, Eat that what you bake today. For today is a seventh, or I'm sorry, eat that which was left over from the sixth day today. For today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it. But on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. So, you had, to get as, you had to get twice as much as usual on the sixth day so that you could rest on the seventh day. God provided a special miracle each Sabbath by preserving the previous day's manna, which would otherwise rot. And the consequence for failing to properly prepare for Sabbath was hunger. Verses 27 and 28. Now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Some people disregarded God's instructions about the Sabbath and went out to gather the manna anyway. But there was none there, 
right? They're like, oops. <laughs> Hopefully, they realize at this point that obedience to God brings blessings and disobedience brings curses. Hopefully, we all realize that same thing, too. They were cursed with hunger for the day. We can be, cur we can be cursed with much worse, depending on our particular folly, right? Depending on how we decide to rebel against God. Verses 29 through 30. Moses says, See, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. So what is this Sabbath that God was making such a big deal here? We've learned so far that it was instituted at creation. We learned that last weekend. It was the seventh day instituted as a memorial of creation. It means rest. That's the literal definition of it. It is an essential component of physical and spiritual health. It is one of God's first object lessons about himself after the Exodus, after the great escape from Egypt. And it is a crucial aspect of learning to trust the provisions of God. And sure enough, just as the Israelites learned of their Sabbath rest after their dramatic escape from bondage, so we also will learn the true Sabbath rest after our dramatic escape from this earth. The Bible says we enter into a 1,000 year reign of peace, and we will talk much more about that on a future night. Oh, I can't wait for that. I wish that was right now. I love that topic. <laughs> all in all, it seems like this concept of Sabbath is a pretty important topic. So let's now use our Bible study techniques where we're going to test what we've learned against the Bible's internal consistency. Remember I said we were going to do that? Back on, I think, probably the first night we were together. We're going to do that, and hopefully we're going to learn a little bit more. The Bible says, in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, this is the fourth commandment. This is only 8 through 10, and verse 11 is on the next one. But God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. It is the fourth commandment that I just read to you. This is one of the ten most important things to God. And it's all about the Sabbath. In fact, this is the longest of the ten commandments. God has more to say about this than he has about any of the other nine principles. The Israelites had largely forgotten the Sabbath after hundreds of years of slavery in Egypt, just as we have largely forgotten it today. God's command to them was to remember the Sabbath, and that command is no less valid for us today. And why? The reason we're supposed to remember is because God made the earth in six days and rested on the seventh day. It is God's memorial in time bearing witness to the origin and the author of this world and his tremendous power. By keeping Sabbath, we proclaim that we are creations of the Almighty Creator. He made us. We are loyal to Him. Sabbath exists for no other real reason, honestly, but to remember creation and the Creator. That's the point. Now, we look around our world today with our 7 point, what, 3 billion of us or whatever. The world has largely forgotten the Sabbath. And that same world largely believes that we evolved up from nothing over endless eons of time. Do you think those two things might be related? Right? Now, you probably haven't noticed the similar language between the fourth commandment, which I have up on the screen right now, 
and the first angel's message. The rest of Revelation 14, 7, right? We already read, Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come. And it actually continues and says, Worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. From the fourth commandment, it said, um, The Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. That is almost identical language. Almost identical. We know at least I hope you know by now. But we know that when Revelation pulls language from the Old Testament, that we can then insert the meaning of that Old Testament passage or story into the prophecy of Revelation. So the first angel's message is God's call to mankind to return to true, pure, biblical worship of the Creator. And how is that true worship described? but with Sabbath language. After falling away from the Sabbath truth for so long, God now extends his invitation to man to join him in his rest every week, to enter a new and deeper relationship with God through the day that he has sanctified and blessed. Now what do I mean, falling away from it for so long? I mean, most Christians in the world today have a special day of worship each week. We haven't fallen away from this Sabbath truth. I want to pause at this moment just to remember that there is a devil at work. That God is in the midst of a war. Right? The devil is engaging God in an eternal conflict. Every beautiful truth of God has a counterfeit by the devil because ultimately the devil is trying to take God's place, right? So he is counterfeiting God. Turn in your Bibles, if you have a Bible with you, to Mark chapter 16. The Gospel of Mark, that's the, the shortest of the four Gospels. It is the second book of the New Testament, in case you don't know that. And I want you all to see it for yourselves. We're only reading two verses, but I want you to see it with your own eyes. We make the Bible so hard, don't we? When it is really so very simple. Give me an amen when you're at Mark 16. Okay. Mark 16. Speaking of the resurrection morning, when they all find out that Jesus is alive again. Mark 16, we're going to read verses 1 and 2. It said, When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices, that they might come and anoint him, Jesus. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. Friends, did you catch that? They came to the tomb when the Sabbath was passed. In other words, the Sabbath is the day before Resurrection Day. What? What? You're saying like, what? That doesn't even make sense. I'm sure there are people in this room right now who may have been taught their entire life that Resurrection Day is the Sabbath day. But we see from the Bible that's not the case. Despite the fact that most Christians in the world today keep the Sabbath by remembering and honoring the Resurrection, that is just not biblically the case. Shouldn't we look into the Bible to find the things that we're supposed to believe? Shouldn't we cling to the truths that the Bible supports? Jesus rose on the first day of the week, according to the Bible. We, in our modern day, call that day Sunday. Or, I mean, you're right, if you go down to Portugal, in, in Portuguese it actually is, like, all their days of the week is first day, second day, third day, fourth day, until you get to... Saturday and Sunday, they have their own names. But I, I thought that was really interesting in Portuguese, where they don't actually have names for every day like we do in English. <clears throat> but in any case, the historical truth is that Christianity as a whole did not officially turn to Sunday keeping at the exclusion of Sabbath keeping until the 500s AD. Many 
Prior to that point, we're actually keeping both days holy, Saturday and Sunday, after a tradition that began, ultimately, to help distinguish Jewish Christians from the Jews at large. This was because the Jews and the Romans were not friends at this point in history, in the 100s AD and thereabouts. In fact, the Jews and the Romans had two terrible wars that nearly destroyed both peoples. The Christians did not want to be caught in the middle of that. And so, many Christians today believe that Jesus instituted a new Sabbath at the cross. But actually, that new Sabbath was created, historically speaking, because of warfare and racism, and not fully incorporated as Christian doctrine for more than 400 years after that. Nearly 500 years. And most of Christianity today, although many do not know better, and many are following the faith that they know as best as they can, are nonetheless, and I'm just, i got to speak plainly from the Bible here, right? God doesn't commission us to beat around the bush. Despite the honest and sincere nature of these people's faith, the biblical reality is that they are worshiping in constant violation of God's fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. That is the only commandment of the ten that begins with the word remember, and yet it's the one that most of us have forgotten. Interesting how clever the devil is, isn't he? Now, some out there say the Sabbath is only for the Jews, but that is also not supported by the Scriptures. We read in Isaiah 56, verses uh, 3 through 7, this is a long passage, so it goes on two or three different slides, but it says, do, this is God speaking, it says, Do not let the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, Here I am, a dry tree. We all know what a eunuch is? This is a male without his male parts. And so you can see how in his mind he would consider himself a dry tree, right? So God says, don't let him feel that way. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant, even to them I will give, a name, or I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them, sorry, I need to go to the next one, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Sabbath breaks down barriers. Sabbath applies to every person on the planet, and it comes to us every week. Even in the Old Testament, it was the angels. They were saying hi. <laughs> Even in the Old Testament, the Sabbath was open for everybody to celebrate. Because God is the God of all flesh. Amen? And as such, His commands are not limited to certain people groups like the Jews. There is no such thing as a Jew at creation. But Sabbath is from creation. See that? As the Creator, Jesus claims ownership of the Sabbath. You see this in Mark chapter 2, verses 27 and 28. Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Biblically speaking, then, which is the Lord's Day? Despite our common vernacular in the 21st century. The day, the Lord's Day is the one that the Lord claims as his own. Sabbath. What else can we know about the Sabbath? Well, God promises a blessing of closeness and relationship that cannot occur outside of the Sabbath. 
Isaiah 58, verses 13 and 14. God says this, If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth, and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Friends, I was in and out of Christian churches my whole life. I was a member of several different churches over the course of my, my youth. And it was not until I discovered the Sabbath that I truly knew God. I began keeping Sabbath about a year before I joined any church. My wife and I, she was not my wife at the time, but she and I would spend the day in nature. And I mean, I, this is not a secret. I, I learned about God here in Santa Cruz. I think this is one of the best places to learn about God. Yeah, I mean, we have all of this wonderful nature all around us. So you can just see God's handiwork right in front of your eyes. And so that's what we would do. We would go out into nature. And we would just hike, and we would be with each other, and be with creation, and be with God. And it was wonderful. It is true that God commands us, asks us, tells us to lie Sabbath in many areas, because Jesus does, in fact, give us rest. But there is actually a specific 24-hour period of time that God has set apart and sanctified and blessed and filled up with his presence. By aligning ourselves with it, with the Sabbath, we come to delight ourselves in the Lord, as the promise in Isaiah 58 says. We will ride on the high hills of the earth. We will eat of Jacob's heritage. And it must happen that way. There's no choice for it to happen that way because the mouth of the Lord has spoken. It's a promise from on high. It is written. So the great controversy, the eternal conflict, this war between God and the devil, between good and evil, it always boils down to this one issue. God says, this is the right way. Do it this way, and you will live. And then the devil comes along and says, man, do it however you want. It's all the same anyway. So here's some examples, just from what we've seen already in the story of hope. God says, don't eat from that tree. The devil says, go ahead and eat it. You won't surely die. God says, get in the ark and you will survive the flood. The devil comes along and says, what flood? It's never rained a day in history. This crazy guy Noah. God says, go and fill the earth after the flood. The devil says, why don't you just stay right here and build yourselves a city with a great big tower instead. God says, paint the door with the blood of the lamb and you will live. The devil says, a lamb isn't magic and God doesn't kill. Relax. God says, make sure to keep Sabbath my way, not your way. My way blesses, but your way misses the blessing. The devil comes along and says, all days are the same. They're all equally blessed. Do whatever you want. Even the day doesn't really matter. God says, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. The devil comes along and says, But the first day sounds so much cooler! It honors the resurrection. Come on! The devil has no shortage of excuses not to obey God. But the most common one that we hear regarding this particular topic is that the Sabbath was part of the old covenant. It was changed at the cross. It doesn't apply anymore. Well, we know that's not true. How do we know that? Biblically. 
Because the Bible says plainly in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 16 and 17, where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Thinking like a, a last will and testament. You can write down anything you want, but until you die, that doesn't mean anything, right? You can rewrite it 20 times. It's only that last one that exists when you die that actually has any merit to it. So, that's what Paul is saying. Now, here's some language we don't much see anymore in our modern translations of the Bible, but in the original King James, we see in Matthew 26, verse 28, Regarding the Last Supper, Jesus says, For this is my blood of the New Testament. In modern translations, that's, that's, that's the New Covenant. But original King James is Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So it's saying, in order for the New Testament, right, or what we most commonly call the New Covenant, to go into effect, then the author of the Testament must die. A man's will means nothing until he actually dies. So biblically then, when did the New Testament or New Covenant go into effect? At the death of Christ. Amen. Well, Galatians 3.15 builds on this. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men. Though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Paul here is saying that once a covenant or a testament is confirmed through the death of the testator, then it cannot be added to or subtracted from. Whatever was the case at, whatever was the, case at the death of Jesus continues on. It constitutes the New Testament or the New Covenant. And Luke makes one thing very clear at the time of Christ's death. Luke 23, verses 55 and 56 the women who had come with him from Galilee, him being the dead now, the now dead Jesus, had come with him from Galilee, followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to what? The commandment. That's right. The commandment. The Sabbath was still a commandment at the death of Jesus. Regardless of what the church would do in the future from that point, the new covenant was sealed with Christ's blood when the fourth commandment was still valid and unchanged. And this should make perfect sense to us, both because I am the Lord, I do not change, Malachi 3.6, so like, duh, of course God will not change the thing that he gave us to remember that he doesn't change. That doesn't make any sense, right? but also because the Sabbath is going to outlast this present world. The Sabbath is a memorial in time for all of eternity. It is written, Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23, For as the new heavens, this is God speaking, as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. So now, let's read this out. The Sabbath was clearly part of the Old Covenant. And the Sabbath is promised by this verse to remain in the new heavens and new earth which God shall make. Don't you think it kind of by necessity also has to be part of the new covenant in Christ's blood? It doesn't make any sense that God would say, it's very important, it's very important, it's very important, not important at all, very important forever. Right? That's illogical. The Bible calls the covenant that Christ sealed in his blood the everlasting covenant. Hebrews 13, verse 20. In fact, it is the Sabbath that links all of us every creature in the whole universe together forever in perfect harmony. Because no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, who you're with, how old you are, whether you're an unfallen angel or a redeemed sinner or some other flavor of creation, all flesh everywhere stops and comes 
together once every seven days to worship the Almighty Creator God forever and ever. Amen. The Sabbath is the glue that links the endless diversity of life across this planet and across the vast universe at large. In well over a hundred languages across the globe today, the word for Sabbath and the name of the seventh day of the week are the same word. Now here's an easy example. In Spanish, it's, who can tell me? Sábado. In Portuguese, it's sábado, right? But this is the case in more than a hundred languages across the world. Sabbath is the evidence that we have a common beginning. Sabbath directly links us to our divine heritage in this manner. Sabbath proudly and triumphantly declares, we are not highly evolved apes. We are sons and daughters of God, made in His image. Amen? Amen. Sabbath is the visible sign to the world of the covenant relationship between God and His people. And that may sound like an extreme claim, I know. But take it up with the Bible. <laughs> Exodus chapter 31, verses 13 and verse 17. There's some verses in the middle there, but it's all part of the same thing if you want to read the whole thing. I'm giving you verses 13 and 17, where the Bible says, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Did you catch that God just said it is the singular sign between us and him forever? Because God made us. God redeemed us. God owns us. We are his. We acknowledge that, and we celebrate His being Lord of our lives by remembering the day that He set aside and blessed. That day stands as a memorial to creation itself. Now friends, I have much more to say on this topic of Sabbath. When I teach it in private classes, I have to do it over two weeks. I tried. I, I can't do it in one week anymore. I have so much to say on this. More than any other Bible truth, the Sabbath profoundly affected my every fiber of my life. As I learned of it more and more, my relationship with God just got stronger and stronger, and I realized more every day the Sabbath's role in the prophecies of Scripture. I mean, I'm sharing it with you now because it affected me so profoundly. I hope that it affects you in the same manner. But I'm going to close tonight with a surprise. I mentioned that Sabbath is on the day that we call Saturday, the seventh day of the week, the day before the resurrection, the day after the death of Christ, which was Friday, the day that Jesus kept holy by resting even in death. He even kept Sabbath when he was dead. That's how important it is to God. But see, it's not entirely the truth to say that it's on Saturday. It's not the entire truth because God tells time differently than we do. I mentioned this in a previous chapter, but we have decided that a day stretches from midnight to midnight. And then many of us, as we did on Sunday, change the definition of midnight twice a year. So it's just like, you know, constantly in flux way of telling time. God is not so arbitrary. God defined a day, all the way back at the beginning. Genesis 1 and verse 5, he called the light day and the darkness night, so the evening and the morning were the first day. This definition never changes in the whole Bible. A, de a day consists of an evening followed by a morning, sunset to sunset. And so Sabbath does not begin at midnight on Saturday, but rather at sundown. On Friday. And wouldn't you know it? Dark outside. Maybe you didn't realize it, but you just attended your first Friday night Sabbath worship, possibly. 
And as such, I invite everybody here to go home tonight, thank the Lord for his gift of holy time, and rest. All right? Turn off the cell phone. Switch off the TV. Turn off the light. Go to bed early. You deserve it. You've had a long week. Amen? Ask God to bless your sleep tonight. Ask God's blessing on the entirety of the next 24 hours. Ask a blessing with me for tomorrow morning's seminar meeting. <laughs> because did you know this church has kindly offered to let us join their regular Sabbath morning worship service? This is a Sabbath-keeping church. I pray that the Holy Spirit will be with us all. I pray that he brings us back in the morning as we can fully connect with him through his special time. And because we are dismissing tonight, I don't know the backgrounds of many of you here, so I don't know for whom this is true, but because we are dismissing tonight into what might be, for some of you, your very first Sabbath observance, let me be the first one to wish you a heartfelt Happy Sabbath, everybody! Happy Sabbath, thank you. Now, for additional reading, there is much material on the topic of Sabbath. It's history, it's controversy, it's place in the Bible. I'm giving you two lengthy articles to take home. One is called How Sunday Became the Popular Day of Worship, and it is a well-cited, uh, well-documented research article. Um, and the other one is kind of a question and answer about various issues relating to it. So it's a lot of paper, and it'll take you some time to get through, but I promise you'll be blessed. And I encourage you to take it home with you tonight. Um, as I said... The Sabbath will be a recurring theme throughout this seminar as we delve deeper into prophecy because it's all over prophecy. Tonight, to recap, we saw God liberate the descendants of Abraham from slavery in a spectacular way. A series of events without equal even to this very day. We saw that immediately following this high energy, high drama, high stress action, God teaches his people to rest. Before anything else, remember the Sabbath day. He reintroduces himself to the world first with a display of power, and then with his commandment of divine rest. We saw how all of this was prophetic of the return of Jesus Christ, how the final plagues on this earth will fall, and Babylon, or Satan's kingdom, will seem defeated. Christ will appear, and Babylon will, excuse me, Babylon will rise one final time in a final onslaught the Bible calls Armageddon, and God will intervene from the heavens to preserve his people while engulfing the wicked in a fiery grave, like he did the Egyptians in a watery grave. Immediately following this, we will lie Sabbath in heaven for a thousand years. We began tonight to truly see the importance and the beauty of the principle of Sabbath. And we came to understand that all of the spiritual concepts of Sabbath stem from the actual, literal Sabbath day of rest. This Sabbath has been observed unbrokenly, even in the deepest ages of church apostasy in history. It has been faithfully kept by God's people since the Garden of Eden. And so tonight... As we close, I am inviting you to do two things. I'm inviting you to reconnect with Sabbath and with the Lord of the Sabbath, which is the real point, if it's a truth that you have known before. If this is not the first time that you are hearing of this, then I'm inviting you to reconnect with this incredible blessing that comes to your own doorstep every single week. And two, if this is a new concept for you, then... I encourage you to give Sabbath a try and see what it's all about. Try it for yourself, right? Jesus delights at the chance to bless you in this way for the first time. He led you here to this seminar so that he could do that. In both cases, in either case, the end result will be a closeness with God that you've not experienced before. Are you willing to believe God tonight? To take him at his word? And to receive this tremendous blessing that comes to us faithfully each and every week, no matter where we are. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing just to give it a try? I'm not asking you to turn your whole lives upside down. I'm saying for the next 24 hours, let's give it a try. Let's see what it's about. Can we do that? 
Who's willing to do that tonight? Show God. Amen. Amen and amen. Jesus Christ, the Lord of the Sabbath, is inviting you to fellowship with him in this special way. And he saw that display of faith. I have faith that there's a party up in heaven right now. I pray that you accept that invitation for the next 24 hours because Jesus will not disappoint you. Let's pray. Merciful God, we thank you so much. We thank you for knowing the heart of man so well, for creating inside of us this need to unplug and rest. Thank you so much for your willingness to fill up this time with yourself and to reveal yourself to us in a profound way, if only we'll let you. And I pray, God, that as we do so, that you keep the promises you've made to us and you show even the most skeptical one here that you mean what you say and that there is a blessing to be had. Thank you so much, God. Keep us safe as we part from this place and allow us to return again in the morning. In your name we pray. Amen.